name is Evan Crawley and I'm with Lincoln County Soil and Water and this is Shelly Walsh with Good Karma Ranch Alpacas. And today we're going to do a virtual farm tour of an alpaca farm. So just hop in and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, welcome to Good Karma Ranch Alpacas. We're excited to have you guys here today to talk a little bit about alpacas. We like to start with a little history about alpacas. Um, alpacas are unique livestock animals in that they have always been fully domesticated animals. So there is no such thing as a wild alpaca. Even um, when you see the pictures of Peru where they're indigenous and you see them on the big expanses of land, um, those alpacas are actually cared for by herders. They're owned by someone. Um, alpacas really can't survive on their own in the wild. They were bred into existence, crossing two other South American camelids. Um, so that makes them a little bit unique. Gotcha. So um, what two? What yeah, two of Guanaco and of Acuna. So two other camelids from South America. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. and they were bred to create a really high quality fiber. Gotcha. Um, and this was about 6,000 years ago, historians estimate that they were bred into existence. And they provided fiber um, for garments for the Incan people. They provided food um, and their manure was used as a fuel source. So they were very important to the Incans. Um, and, and then around, if you remember back to history class, um, around the 18th century, the Spanish exploration. Um, and when they got to South America and discovered the alpacas, historians estimate that they killed off about 98% of the alpacas that were there at the time. I guess if you're trying to control a population, you take away what's the most important thing to them. And that was the alpaca. Um, and the alpacas that survived did so by fleeing to the tops of the mountainsides. And that's where they pretty much reside today. And their mountains aren't like the Rocky Mountains. They're sort of high desert plateaus. So um, the alpacas have learned to become very efficient eaters and drinkers, and they slowly repopulated. Um, over many hundreds of years now, um, but there's still only about 5 million alpacas on the planet. And that may sound like a lot of alpacas, but when you compare it to the approximately 100 million sheep on the planet, you can see that um, we're significantly smaller in size. Gotcha. Um, and we have about 250,000 alpacas in the United States. Um, again, I think there are estimated to be around 5 million sheep in the United States. So. Again, super small industry still. We need more alpaca farmers, so I'll just throw that out there. <laughs> oh yeah, no, that's fine. So, uh, one of my questions is, do they, since they were bred back 6,000 years ago, do they still look the same as, were they, are they smaller, bigger, are they? Yeah, I believe the that they are about the same. The fiber, um, the fiber is getting better and better all the time as we sort of, take a more scientific approach to it now gotcha. um, and breed specific specific animals to specific animals. The fiber is getting better and better. Gotcha. And I do have some examples of fiber since it is their purpose. So that black fiber is sheep's wool and you can feel it's pretty coarse. Um, it's oily um, and uh, it usually has a little bit of an odor to it because of the oil in there. Gotcha. And then the white fiber is alpaca fiber. Um, and both the sets of, uh, of fiber are straight off the animal, not cleaned. I didn't cheat. So you gotcha. can see it's significantly softer. Oh yeah. There's it's no oils different. in it. Um, and alpacas are actually considered hypoallergenic because they have no dander. So a lot of times when people wear wool sweaters made mm -hmm. out of sheep's wool, they have to wear something under it because they're having an allergic reaction. They're having an itch. Gotcha. And with the alpaca fiber, you won't have that itch. They're hypoallergenic. Now how common is, uh alpaca fiber you know on the marketplace yeah it's not so based on the size that we were just talking about the number of animals mm -hmm. it's it's not as common in the united states now if you go to south america and buy a wool sweater it's alpaca gotcha. um, but here in the united states it's still um very much a niche industry so you'd have to get it from somebody that does alpacas and you're not going to find yeah. it you're starting to find it a little bit in retail stores. China is the largest importer of alpacas right now. Um, they did a study looking at the viability of the fiber market and decided to go for it. So you'll start, you're starting to see at places like Banana Republic and other places there's 5% alpaca in a sweater. So it's not enough to make a big difference, but mm -hmm. it's slowly getting into the market. I understand. A lot of our clothes are made there. And from a color standpoint, yeah. how many colors do they come in? So there's about 16 natural colors, uh, main colors. Then obviously there's variations slightly within. Yeah. There's spotted or what we call Appaloosa alpacas. Um, so there are several colors. This is a little 
hopefully you can see it, but anything from bright white to jet black, lots of grays. So on this side of our farm, this is where all the female alpacas live. So this is all moms and babies. Our male alpacas live on the other side of the farm in a different barn mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. Um, so these are all moms and babies. And they're full fleeced at this point. Alpaca fiber doesn't stop growing at a year. Uh, it would continue to grow endlessly until you shear it off. But because of the heat of our summers and the humidity of our summers, we have to shear or they will have heat stress and not make it through the summer. Gotcha. Alpacas don't sweat like people. So they really need to get all this fiber off before they're not set up for humidity at all. Yeah. Do they like being sheared? That's they do not like being sheared. <laughs> they're pretty dramatic about it, but I can understand. They don't necessarily yeah. understand what's happening to them. Um, but it doesn't harm them. It's like getting a haircut. Um, it takes our shear about five and a half minutes from start to finish per animal. So that includes shearing the animal, cutting their toenails, and trimming their teeth if necessary. They do it all in five minutes. Five and a half minutes. Holy cow. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. It's quite an art form. Um, it's not an easy, an easy thing to do. Let's see if I can grab this one here. Fancy. So I was gonna see if I can show you um, how long, just don't stand behind her because they do kick, but. I just wanted to see if I could show you how long the fiber is so you could understand. Do you want to just like put your hand in there? I mean, that covers pretty much the majority of my fingers. Right. So you're looking at, you know, four to six inches in length and you're doing that all around their entire body. So we get about five to nine pounds of fiber per animal per year. It's a lot of fiber. They are, they look like big animals. She probably only weighs about 120 pounds. Mm -hmm. it's, she's all fluff. So gotcha. once we shear, they look so much smaller. <laughs> um, they look like little Q-tips. I tell people yeah. running around because we don't shear their head. The other thing I was going to show you, she'll let me, is the teeth. They don't have any top front teeth. Can you see that? No top front teeth on an alpaca. That gray thing that you're looking at is just like her gums. It's her top palate. And then the bottom teeth line up to that. So we want those bottom teeth to line up nicely to that top palate so they can eat. If their teeth get overgrown, it makes it really difficult for them to eat the grass. They do have molars on the top and the back so they can chew, <laughs> but no top front teeth needed for anything. Do they have to have a special diet because they don't just the one set? Or? No, they um they eat grass and hay. We give them a little bit of grain in the morning, um, and that's that's the extent of it. <laughs> They're very efficient eaters. They only eat about one percent of their body weight a day in food. So mm -hmm. if you compare that to a horse, it's dramatically mm -hmm. different. Do they ruminate? They do. They are ruminants. Uh, so ruminants. So they have a multi-chamber stomach, or some people say they have two stomachs, but they have a multi-chamber, three-compartment stomach. Um, and they have to keep their gut uh, moving to stay healthy. So they have rumen in their gut um, and they need to keep that um, moving. And how they do that is they chew their cud. And what that looks like is, um, they looks like they're chewing even though they're not eating anything. And they're chewing and chewing and then they'll swallow their cud and you can watch it. Hopefully we'll catch one doing it while, they're, while you're here. And then if you wait a second, they regurgitate it right back up and they keep chewing their cud. And that means you have a healthy, very content alpaca. Um, it's just kind of like keeping their, keeping their room and moving. Yeah. It's really important to their health. So they're all a little dirty. We've had a lot of rain lately. <laughs> a lot of rain lately. And you were explaining before, so the color that y'all are going for is this uh, more of a tan or a white yeah. uh, color, just because you can dye and things like that. The, the, the yeah, wool. you can do a lot with light colored fiber as far as making clothing or blankets, etc. Alpaca fiber holds dye very well, so um, it just it makes it nice to have the light color. I will point out we have some babies from fall. Um, these four little babies over here. Um, these guys were born between October and December of 2020. Um, those four there and alpacas are born well their gestation is about 345 350 days some of them go over a year and um, when they're born they're around 15 to 18 pounds or so they look like little baby deer it's like all legs little bodies they come out the color that they'll be 
and they come out with a whole bunch of fiber and they grow very rapidly. They grow, we hope for them to grow between 0.5 and 0.8 pounds per day. Um, so you can see they've, they've grown a lot since they were born. They stay real close with their moms um, for the first few days and then they get more and more independent um, and play. They play like crazy together. I love when we have multiple babies because they just have such a good time. Alpacas make fantastic moms. In 10 years of breeding alpacas, we've never had a, a mom reject a baby. And um, for a livestock animal, that's pretty unusual. So from, a, um, from females, how many do you have all together? I think you said once. Right now have? we have 25 alpacas. 25. Um, biting my clothes. Okay. And we have 25 alpacas right now. Um, they have one baby at a time. Okay. So it's a long process. So you consider it a year birth. Um, and then one baby per animal. Gotcha. And they can start breeding when they're two, and they can breed until um, they die. Gotcha. <laughs> they can breed continually every year. So from a weight standpoint, uh, and these are all for fiber, right? These, yes. Uh, so how much fiber can you get off of each one of these? About five to nine pounds per animal per year. So it's quite a bit of fiber. It makes a lot of yarn. Um, they all need haircuts. Some of them it looks like can't see, right? <laughs> They're ready for their haircuts. And are the males, I mean, they pretty much the same? Yeah, about 10 pounds bigger. Gotcha. Outside of that, you couldn't tell. This is a little boy. He's getting ready to um, move to the boy's side of the farm. Uh, probably um, next week, we're considering uh, that he's going to move over to, to the boys. It's a little hard on them. To wean from their moms but they figure it out. <laughs> this is called cushing the way they lay down like this. This gotcha. is how alpacas relax. Okay. Alpacas don't lay down and go to bed at night like a goat yeah. or like a dog. Um, they're more like a horse so there's like cat naps on and off throughout the day and night. Gotcha. But when they do want to lay down and relax this is how they do it. It looks very awkward and funny but this is how they lay down. Relax. And then from a, because you do have the llama in the yes, back, what's the difference between these yeah. and that one? Yeah, very good question. So um, the alpacas, as I mentioned, are really, their primary purpose is fiber in the United States. Mm -hmm. There is a meat market for it, but um, it's very small. And they really don't have any other, you know, they're not carrying anything for you. They're small, like we talked about. A llama's purpose, on the other hand, um, is more of a utility animal is how I explain it. So uh, she weighs about 350 pounds. So she's about 200 pounds bigger than an alpaca. She can carry a pack of your stuff if you want to go on a hike. If she were trained, she could pull a small cart with a person in it. So she's a beast of burden, so to speak. Like she can carry, carry things for you. She does grow a beautiful fiber. She's gray, as you can see. Um, but it's not nearly as soft as the alpaca fiber, so we really just leave it for the birds. Gotcha. Um, we don't do much with it. Coco is 18 years old, and um, that's quite old for a llama. Life expectancy is around 20 for a llama, mm -hmm. around 15 to 18 for an alpaca. Gotcha. She's super healthy though. We don't anticipate any immediate problems. You can see she's nice and chunky and quite happy. The only changes we've noticed is she definitely has arthritis. Mm -hmm. it takes her a while to sit down and stand back up. Gotcha. <laughs> but other than that, she's doing well. Now, if you notice her ears, her ears are banana shaped. And if you look at the alpacas, the ears are triangular. And that's always a distinguishing factor. Like if you don't have a size reference and you're not as familiar with these animals, the mm -hmm. ears are always a dead giveaway. So feed wise, Yep. I mean, I know we kind of talked about, but what mm -hmm. special, I know like yep. uh, sheep have to have it, goats yeah. have to have special stuff. Is there anything? Yeah, so they need a certain amount of protein um, in their feed and in their hay. Um, they don't really need feed. A lot of alpaca farms actually don't feed grain. We like to feed grain on our farm. They only get about a half a cup to a cup of feed per animal per day. And we just spread it out in these all these bins you see here. Um, and it's really more of a health check for us. So alpacas are extremely stoic. If an alpaca is sick, it will stay with the herd and move with the herd. It doesn't want to be singled out. 
So what we feed so that um, if an alpaca stands there and pretends to eat but doesn't actually eat, then we know we have a health issue we need yeah. to get on top of. So Murphy is a Murphy is a great Pyrenees. That's the breed dog that he is. And he's a guardian animal for us. He's not a herding dog. A lot of people come to the farm and assume that he's here to herd alpacas. He has no knowledge on how to herd an alpaca, but he really does think that these alpacas are his alpacas. And if you place a great Pyrenees with livestock when they're young, they bond to the animal themselves. So he thinks they're his, they're part of his family, and he does everything he can to protect them. So what we there are a lot of different breeds of dogs that will guard livestock, but we really like the Great Pyrenees because of this exact reason. He loves people for the most part. So we can have visitors to the farm and he will tolerate them. He will protect his alpacas. So what we're protecting against where we live in North Carolina, we're lucky we don't have a lot of predators here. Um, our farm friends out in the, in the West Coast have to worry about mountain lions and things. Yeah. We're worrying about coyotes. And actually the biggest predator to an alpaca where we live is actually a dog. So a neighbor's dog down the street gets out by accident. Mm -hmm. They all end up at our fence. Really? I'm not even kidding. So there's a lot of smells here and a lot of interesting animals. They all end up at our fence line if they get out. Murphy cannot stand other dogs. So as sweet as he is, um, when he sees other dogs or smells something that's unusual, he really, you've seen it, we've talked about this, he really, it's like flipping a light switch. Um, and he becomes very intimidating. Uh, but he, so he does a really, really good job. We've always had a livestock guard dog in the 10 years we've been raising alpacas and we've never had an issue. They're really amazing creatures. So poop is kind of a unique characteristic of these alpacas. So alpacas and llamas um, share a communal dung pile. So unlike most livestock that just walk around the farm pooping and eating wherever they want, alpacas have bathroom areas. So if an alpaca is over there and wants to go to the bathroom, it, she's gonna walk over here to go to the bathroom. There's a, there's a few spots around the farm, it's not just this one, um, but they do keep themselves very uh, tidy in this way. And so we pick up all the manure off the farm two times a day, every day. It was clean before you got here. <laughs> and you can actually put alpaca manure straight into your vegetable garden or your flower garden and it doesn't burn. It's not a hot manure. Um, so, But we do compost it just because we have so much of it. Um, but this is great because it keeps the farm clean. Um, it also keeps the alpacas pretty healthy because they won't eat where they poop. So this really helps to cut down on intestinal parasites. Now, do y'all do anything else other than alpacas on we do not. Just um, most well, we have a couple goats, but just one. Gotcha. And this we do run the farm on solar. That's what that giant thing is under there. So we are 100% solar powered, which has been really fun. We've been solar powered for, I don't know, I'd say eight years or more. If they're making five to nine pounds of, uh, you know, the wool form, how much are you making for that? Fiber. Yeah, it's a really good question. So we we have chosen as a small farm to, we don't really sell outright a lot of alpaca fiber. We do have a couple ladies that come every year and want to buy fiber because they spin, but there aren't people at home really spinning and making yarn that often. So we found a better model for us as a small farm is we are a member of an alpaca fiber cooperative and it's a fiber cooperative. So what we do is we, as a member, we give them our farm or give them our fiber for free, we give it to them. They pool it together with all the other member farms fiber. Now they have thousands of pounds of fiber and they go to the mill on our behalf and say, we wanna make socks or gloves or whatever we wanna make and we have this much fiber and they handle that whole process and then we get the products back gotcha. as, a, as a member of the co-op. So, we, we buy those products back from the co-op under wholesale. Mm -hmm. So our profit in the fiber is the difference between wholesale price and what we pay. Gotcha. Because we're a fiber contributor. Does that make sense? Yes. So it for does. us, the, the money in this is actually in the retail product itself. Gotcha. And then we have the breeding side of our business where we sell animals to other breeders. We have a stud service. Mm -hmm. And then the third kind of channel of our business for making money is the agritourism piece. So the farm tours, the alpaca yoga, all that stuff. 
Um, so between those three things, it works. You'll have to explain that one real quick. What is, Alpaca yoga? Yeah, I need to know what that is. So you've sure. heard of goat yoga? Oh yeah. Yeah, so we had so many requests like to do, well, can you do alpaca yoga? And I was like, it'll never work, it'll never work. And so, but we kept getting so many requests. I, I have a friend who happens to teach yoga and I said, would you humor me? Can we give this a try? She's like, sure. So we gave it a try with just some friends. The alpacas love it. Really? It's hysterical. So we, um, we have a fenced in area out front. People come, they pay, they bring their own mat and we teach, an, we teach a yoga class. Um, and the alpacas participate and um, they love the yoga mats. So they typically take over people's mats and carry on. Um, it's really fun. It's really fun. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Get Murph working. Do they do their little thing? I mean, do they stand up and walk around you the whole time you're doing yeah, it? Yeah, they don't step on. Well, the goal no. is they don't step on you, yeah. not like yoga. But they, I put out alfalfa hay, uh -huh. um, which for them is like a very big treat. It's sort of like chocolate gotcha. cake. Yeah. So we use it just for yoga because um, it's really high in protein. They don't need gotcha. a lot of it. Uh, so we sprinkle that out in between everybody's mats and that keeps them moving um, awesome. between everybody's mats. It's really fun. So how, when do y'all do those? We Is do those on the weekends. So we've started gotcha. up again. So spring through fall. Gotcha. Um, and we do three, usually three weekends a month. So when we shear the alpacas, mm -hmm. they send it off to the mill. Um, clean it and do everything. But part of the process is, you know, it's not this that they're turning into yarn, right? This is what came off the animal. They have to clean it and dry it. Then they do what's called carding. And it would be done on a machine at the mill. This was done by hand years ago and it's starting to fall apart a little bit. But basically it looks like a big piece of felt almost. So it's all these little pieces of fiber that get combed together. Mm -hmm. So it looks like one big piece, if that makes sense, almost like a piece of felt, and that's called carding. And this is what they spin into yarn. Um, mine's been touched by so many visitors, it's starting to fall apart, but it's this carded alpaca fiber that they turn into yarn. And depending on what they wanna make, um, you know, they can dye it or they can blend it with other types of fiber, they could blend it with hemp, they can blend it with cotton, with she with sheep's wool, anything that they wanted to. Um, so then, then, depending on what they want to make, is how thick the yarn would be, or if it's colored. Um, this is an example of throw blankets. This is all alpaca. This actually has 20% wool. These are nice. These are all U.S. alpaca um, and U.S. sheep, and made in the U.S. So we're really proud of this. Um, so these are all different kinds of blankets, different styles. Poncho, same thing. This is actually alpaca with a little bit of sheep's wool as well, made in the US. And obviously there's tons of different kinds of yarn. Um, yarn is one of our bigger sellers. Um, and this is alpaca yarn, super soft. And um, sweaters, etc. Our biggest selling product is always a sock, a fun sock. So we have everything from um, a sports sock, which I live in these. So anything from a low profile sports sock you can wear year round. Your feet don't sweat. Alpaca fiber is wicking. Um, and it also doesn't hold odor. So I usually wear my socks a few times before I wash them. Um, and then you've got, you know, your fun little socks. And then these really super warm, what we call survival socks. Um, all different kinds of beanies and gloves. So you name it, anything made out of fiber or anything made um, out of a natural fiber can be made with alpaca fiber. And then we do show our alpacas. So these are some of the ribbons over the years. Um, there is a whole um, show circuit, just like you would think of like a dog show. Um, mm -hmm. there, is, there are alpaca shows and uh, we just go to the region, kind of the regional. What do they look um, for in the show? I mean, what's so this is about place? fiber. It's usually 80% fiber, 20% confirmation. So an alpaca has a breed standard. They're supposed to look a certain way, be proportional, have the erect ears. Gotcha. So that's part of it as well, but it is um, based on how the quality of the fiber versus the other animals standing next to them. So we really just have these five boys that are over here right now. Um, but a couple things about the boys. We've learned over time that boy alpacas are happier in smaller groups. There's a lot of fighting that goes on among
amongst the boys on this side it can get very physical there's just a much more clear hierarchy over here more of a pecking order so what we found is typically you organize them by age because then you're organizing by the size and they can't board each other as easily yeah. so on this side where we're standing this is where our youngest males live now right now i only have one uh, male the one closest to us there that's max you asked me who one of my favorites is he's one of my favorites he um he's about 20 months old or so he's small for his age he had a rough start um almost didn't live at birth but he's great now so he just won't be quite as big but i don't have any other young males so that other guy standing there with him is our oldest alpaca that's polaris and you can see he's thinner he, we have a really hard time keeping weight on him he's not aging that well but he um is a great leader for max and they get along well Ma polaris isn't interested in fighting anymore he's too old gotcha. so these two live well together mm -hmm. um and then on this side we can walk down um these three males are our full-grown uh breeding males so these are the more of the stud quality alpacas um and they can get pretty grumpy with each other uh in time they do fight so they're not as they're not as friendly i guess is the right word they're not aggressive with people or anything yeah. they're just more they're just boys they just could care less about company and people and so um the main herd sire on our farm is this boy here his name's lover's legend we call him lover and then the, the next beige boy out there his name's moon and then the brown alpaca is sizzlin and sizzlin is retired he's getting much older now um, and these two, the fiber quality on these two males is far superior to Sizzle. So Sizzle just gets to hang out now, Gosh. which is fine. Mm -hmm. From the fiber standpoint again, uh, their necks and like, oh, so Lord, what's I'm the sorry. best? Yeah, the best fiber on an alpaca is from their shoulder to their hip. And we call that the prime mm -hmm. or we nickname it, a lot of people call it the blanket. Because when you shear an alpaca, um, it comes off in one piece and stays together and it looks like a blanket laying on the ground so it's called the blanket and that's the best part of any individual alpaca fiber not every alpaca fiber is the same as each other but that's the best out the fiber on any given animal and then the leg fiber is considered thirds it's called and it's shorter it's more coarse we don't cut as much off of it. We like to keep some leg fiber so that the, the bugs don't bother them. And then the neck fiber is what we call seconds. Um, it's just used for a little bit. It's, a, it's just used for different things. It might be a little shorter. Um, so we do separate it all on shearing day and send it off in three different bags. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, uh, thank you for joining us on this virtual farm tour. We've really enjoyed it, learned a lot about alpacas. Uh, and Yeah, we would love to encourage you to come out to see us at the farm. Uh, we're in Iron Station, North Carolina. You can find us online at goodkarmaranch.com. We're on Instagram and Facebook with the same handle, Good Karma Ranch. Um, and we do farm tours six days a week. We have alpaca yoga, which we talked about a little earlier. <laughs> um, so come out and see us.